a little bit confusing. What is an organic gardener? So we're going to talk about that today. So one of our things that I'm hoping you'll take away today is what does organic mean? Um, why is organic gardening, you know, why should we do it? Why does it matter? There's some obvious things, but maybe some you haven't thought of. And then I have come up with five steps to uh, building a healthy organic vegetable garden. These are kind of gleaned from some reading I've done and some training I've had. And I think it comes down to about five things. All right, so let's get started. So what does organic mean? Well, if you go to the grocery store and you buy vegetables like celery or lettuce, you might see this USDA organic label on there. And for farmers who grow organic vegetables, there are really specific rules for what denotes organic. They have to be certified. They have to, you know, not use a whole certain list of uh, pesticides. There's certain ones that are allowed. Uh, there are things like they can't use sewage sludge. They can't irradiate the food. So some of those things don't apply very well to us as home gardeners. But the ones that apply well for home gardeners are these three that I've put up here for you. So the first is no genetically engineered crops. And sitting here today, honestly, most of us would not go out to your home improvement store and find genetically engineered seed. They're, they're you know, they're very expensive. Uh, mostly very large companies are making those kinds of seed. Uh, they might be putting herbicide resistance into them, that type of thing. But I just put it up there because if you are concerned about it, one way to make sure you don't get any engineered crops is by buying organic seed. One of the things about organic seed is it's certified not to contain genetically engineered seed. Um, the second one I think is what most people think of when they think of organic gardening, which is no synthetic fertilizers or synthetic pesticides. Um, this doesn't mean no fertilizers or pesticides, just not synthetic types. And then the last one is, is, I think, gets to a little bit more what I think organic really means. It's, it's kind of a value system. It's not so much that it's barely a strict rule. There's no organic police for home vegetable gardener. It's about promoting ecological balance in your garden. Okay, so one of the ways to promote ecological balance is not to use synthetic pesticides because synthetic pesticides often destroy other populations than what the target is that we want to get rid of. Things like our wonderful honeybees can be destroyed by synthetic pesticides. So we want to reduce exposure to those, both for ourselves, our children, anyone who eats the food. You also have to think about when you're applying it, you get it exposed, when you're storing it in your shed, when you throw it into the landfill. All of these ways are ways that that synthetic pesticide goes into the environment. So we really want to limit that. Uh, by limiting that, we almost automatically protect biodiversity. Um, we want to protect the Chesapeake Bay, and you may say, why would I think about that? I live up here in Washington County, I'm not anywhere near the bay. Well, we actually are in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, so the things we do in our backyards really do impact the bay. If we're over applying fertilizer, it washes into the bay. Um, we want to encourage recycling, and one of the wonderful things about organic gardening is that there's so many opportunities to recycle. I put newspaper out in my vegetable garden and cover it with straw. Uh, I do composting where I'm recycling my food scraps, so there's lots of ways to, to incorporate that philosophy into organic gardening. And then the last one is saving money. I don't know if you've gone to the grocery store recently and bought organic produce, but it is so expensive. It's, it's at least 25% more and sometimes twice or three times as much as conventional produce. Okay, so let's go and we'll start now into our five steps. So the first step is building up the soil. And you can see on the right that this soil looks a lot better. It's darker, it's more crumbly. You can see some of the roots sticking out through, and that's what we want. We want soil that's not so dense like this. So how do we get that? Well, the key really is organic matter. And I know sometimes people want to put sand in their soil and other kinds of amendments, but the best way, honestly, to break that clay and to improve the soil is to add organic matter. If you have about eight inches of soil that you want to amend and it's clay, you need to put about two inches of compost or organic matter in there so that you will begin to create that kind of effect. Every year after, you want to at least put about another inch on there because it will begin to be used up. Organic matter is really amazing stuff. It, um, it's from dead organisms, maybe it could be dead leaves, you know, all kinds of things that go into organic matter. And, it improves the soil structure. Whether you have sandy soil, it will make it hold water better. 
if you have clay soil, it makes it drain better. So it's, it's great either way. Um, it increases all the good microbes that help battle plant diseases. It makes you see lots of earthworms, which are fertilizing the soil through their castings and aerating the soil. And the neat thing about it, too, is it acts like a sponge for nutrients. It will hold the nutrients and then release them to the plant slowly. So it acts kind of like a slow-release fertilizer. So lots of advantages to organic matter. You may say, how do I get this stuff? It's so great. Well, one way is to make it through composting. And on your green sheet, there is a link there for, for how to set up your own composting. Um, you can buy compost up at the Washington County Landfill or the Frederick Landfill. I think the Washington County, it's like $20 a ton. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's not that expensive if you have a way to go get it. Um, another brand that is uh, local you'll see here is this Leaf Grow brand. There's a picture there. That's actually made down in Montgomery County. From uh, They pick up yard waste from Montgomery and Prince George's counties and make it into bagged compost. And the quality of that compost is quite high. So that's one that you can find out at your local garden center. The other option would be composted manure. Um, one thing we want to be careful of using manure is manure is coming from animals and often there will be bacteria in that manure, such as E. coli, that we don't want in our gardens. Um, a lot of farmers will put manure on in the fall and allow it to sit, you know, for six months or so, and that's fine. It'll degrade those microbes, but as a gardener in a vegetable garden, I would caution you that I think it's really better to buy composted manure. That way it has been heated up and those microbes that are in there that could be potentially pathogenic are destroyed. So just look for the word compost. Pretty much all of the manure you see at a garden center in bags will say composted manure. And then another way I do a lot in my garden is to add organic mulches. You know, I use straw or, like I said, newspaper, things that will break down, and those also add organic matter to your soil. Now, if you're not sure about your own soil and you think, well, I don't know what my percent organic matter is and I don't know what the pH is and that kind of thing, the thing I would really advise you to do is to get a soil test. It's only about $10. Um, the University of Maryland <laughs> Extension Service up at, in Boonesboro on uh, 65 in Sharpsburg Pike uh, can help you. There's also a link here on your green sheet uh, for soil testing. Um, you can put it in any kind of bag, plastic bag, but if you wanted to use the little paper soil test bags, they have those at the Ag Center. They also have a soil corer if you want to, like, let's say you want to do, like, seven spots in your yard and you want to just take a little skinny core out. They'll loan you a corer up there at the center. So those are ideas. Um, things to look at on the test that say, yes, my soil is healthy, is that it's a loam. Uh, the pH is about 6 to 6.8 and organic matter of greater than about 4%. So like I said, if you put about two inches of organic matter in your top eight inches of soil, you will be at about 4% organic matter in your soil. Okay, so let's assume you've got great soil now. We're gonna put the right plant in there at the right place at the right time. That's our step two. So one of the things you wanna look for when you go to the garden center is that you're picking healthy seedlings. It seems sort of obvious, but you know, some of the seedlings I see out at the centers don't look that great. And you need to make sure they look like they're nice and green, the stems are strong. You can even lift them up out of the pot and check that they have a nice root system. So those are some things to look for. Um, another one of the, the important things in organic gardening is to consider disease resistance when you buy plants or seed. If you buy seed or plants that are naturally disease resistant, you're 80% of the way there to not having to use pesticides and you know, have any diseases. So it's important to consider that in your garden. Um, there are so many choices of seeds now. I mean, I don't know if you're like me, but my, I open my mailbox and it's just stuffed with seed catalogs now. Once they get a hold of you and they know you're a gardener. Um, and there's just lots of choices. So I was going to talk about a few things here that I think sometimes there's con some confusion about. So um, some of the seeds, like this purple bean here, is an open pollinated heirloom. And what open pollinated means is if you can imagine that you have your plants out in your garden and the bees come and the wind is blowing and they get pollinated openly. And then the, um, so for example with this plant, the beans that are inside of these pods, if you took those and let them mature and planted them, you would get purple beans next year. You get the same kind of plant. It breeds true every year. So these kinds of seeds that are open pollinated, you can save the seeds year to year. And this is what has led to heirloom varieties, where people have saved seeds over generations because they have traits that they like. You know, it might be 
the color, the flavor, you know, those beautiful purple tomatoes, things like that. Um, so open pollinated and heirloom are somewhat synonymous, but I would say heirloom is maybe a subset of open pollinated. It's, it's where they've been saved over time. Okay, hybrid. This is an example of a hybrid eggplant seed packet. And what the word hybrid means is that some breeder took two plants, one that had something they really liked, maybe a super sweet tomato, and another trait like a disease-resistant tomato, and cross-pollinated them. This is a natural process. It's not genetic engineering. It's just a natural cross-pollination, but it's intentional. And then they got the seeds from that plant. If you go home and take those hybrid seeds and plant them, you would get sweet tomatoes with disease resistance. The problem is, if you try to save the seeds out of those tomatoes and plant them the next year, you might get some seeds that make sweet tomatoes, some that make disease resistant tomatoes. They'll be all mixed up. So they don't breed true. So you don't want to save hybrid seeds, is what I'm telling you. You can save the open pollinated ones, but not the hybrid ones. So you might say, well, I'm not big into seed saving, and what, what, what should be my choices? Well, hybrid seeds often have a lot more disease resistance. So in organic gardening, I'd encourage that I think you should have some of the hybrids, like with tomatoes, they would have verticillium and fusarium and nematode resistance in those hybrid tomatoes. That doesn't mean you shouldn't grow some heirlooms too, but maybe it's good to hedge your bet and have some of each. So I hope that helps you understand that a little bit better. Now the right hand packet says organic, and see how it has that same USD organic symbol on it. They don't always say that, like the one I've given you in your, um, here you'll see this is a grow it, eat it seed of lettuce, uh, the packet there, that says organic gourmet lettuce mix. Sometimes it just has the word organic on it. Some companies like High Mowing, they only make organic seeds. So, you know, and you'll see burpees now making organic seeds. So it's really a popular thing. So what is organic seed? That means that the seed are not genetically engineered, the seed are not treated. So if you open that seed packet, you won't find that pink fungicide on the seeds. And also, um, they have been taken from plants that were grown using organic methods. Some people like to buy organic seeds because they want to promote organic growing of the plants to make the seeds. You can have open pollinated heirloom organics, you can have hybrid organics. It's all about how they grow the plants to get the seeds. Okay, so I hope that helps clear some of that up. Okay, then we want to plant in the right place. And uh, I'm sure if I could talk to you individually, you probably all have different kinds of gardens. I mean, it could be in a container, a raised bed. Um, my garden is a kind of a mix. I mostly have raised beds. Some have wood sides on them. Some are just sort of raised, mounded beds. What I like about the way I have mine set up is it has permanent walkways in it because you can really compact your soil a lot if you're just have a square, you change the way you plant it every year. Um, if you could look at that aerial view in time, you'd see where the, where the compacted points are. So it's nice if you can set aside areas that are specifically for the vegetables in areas where you walk, and that tends to be very successful. Um, you know, plants need sun to make food, and so we say at least six hours of sun a day. I think it's better to have eight if you can. Um, access to water, and of course you want to protect them from the critters that'll try to get at your vegetables. Uh, we want to plant at the right time, and there are, um, you know, some things that we all are aware of, like lettuce is a spring crop or the fall. We have our uh, squashes and tomatoes in the summer. But what I've given you in your sheets here is this calendar. It's a planting calendar for uh, Central Maryland, and it works well for us. Um, if you're not keen on looking at it this way with this bar chart, on your green sheet there's also one that says uh, find planting dates for vegetable crops in Maryland. That one is just like it'll say broccoli and then give a date. So it, however you want to look at it, there's two different ways. I like this chart. It kind of shows um, things like when to start your seeds inside, when to plant your seedlings outside. Um, it also has some things for fall planting. So I think that calendar is a very valuable resource. All right, so our third step is fertilizing wisely. And what we're showing here, this gardener is applying bone meal, which is a source of phosphorus and also some calcium, basically ground up animal bones. Um, this is muriate of potash is a form of potassium. And so you may ask, well, what do these different nutrients do? So our next slide here is showing the three main plant nutrients that you'll see in most all fertilizers, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Nitrogen is for the leaves, um, so you can think of it as the upward part of the plant. 
phosphorus is what you think of it as. It can be the fruit, but it's often thought of as the roots and flowers. And potassium is just overall health and disease resistance. The symbol for potassium is K, I guess because these are both P. So, um, I put an example down here of garden tone. Garden tone is an organic fertilizer that comes in a dry form. And um, it has an NPK of 344. So what this means on the bag is that 3% of what is in that bag is nitrogen, 4% is phosphorus, 4% is potassium. So if you think of comparing that to some of the synthetic fertilizers, like uh, if you look at the blue miracle Grow, that is, I think it's 28, 16, 15, something like that. I mean, it's got a much higher percentage of what's in it that are um, these uh, compounds. Sometimes in some of the commercial synthetic fertilizers, like you'll see the one that we know a lot is 10, 10, 10. So it has 10 of each of these. That's all it has. There's nothing else. The interesting thing about organic fertilizers is that they supply a wide range of nutrients. They're made from natural products. So if you look at that garden tone bag to see what's in it, it's got stuff like feather meal and alfalfa meal and poultry manure and, you know, a mix, a mix of all kinds of stuff. And so each of those compounds has a lot of micronutrients like iron and boron and molybdenum and things that we don't think about but that plants need. So um, one of the things I would just say really about organic fertilizers is they offer a very wide range of nutrients for the plants, which is great. The other thing is that if you apply something like just a synthetic fertilizer, what happens is it's kind of like giving your kids a candy bar. It's like, woohoo, you know, all the sugar rush that the plant gets. And sometimes the plant grows too fast. It'll be almost succulent and soft, and it's a great for the pests to come and get at it. So sometimes by giving them more of a granola bar, you're in a better place, you know, because you get a slow release of the, of the nutrition. So that's the way to kind of think about the organic fertilizers. The other thing with the um, synthetic ones because they will, you know, the plant can't possibly take all of that up when you first give it to it. So what happens is a lot of it will wash off and go out into the groundwater and down into the bay. And so we would be really the ultimate thing would be to have good organic matter to act like a sponge to hold on to these nutrients, offer organic uh, fertilizers, and then let that system work. The microbes in the soil will break these organic fertilizers down and release nutrients to the plants. And it acts like a slow release system. And it, it works. It's really great. The one thing I would say personally is I find difficult is when I'm starting seedlings or first transplanting to the garden, you know, sometimes the organic fertilizers are a little slow. One exception is the fish emulsion. It's pretty quick to release the nitrogen. The other one is kelp, it's pretty fast. So if you're really determined to be organic, I would say you can substitute you know, a, a fish emulsion kelp mixture for your blue liquid to get your seedlings started. Once they're out in the garden, I think really you can use the organic granular fertilizers and with organic matter, you're good to go. You might find in the season that you need to give them another little punch of, of fertilizer. Okay, uh, the other neat thing about some of these, like this garden tone, and that's just one example, miracle Grow actually offers an organic fertilizer now, and it also comes with good microbes actually in the bag, so that's kind of neat. So they're uh, putting those in your soil for you to get, get them started to be able to degrade, um, you know, the organic matter and to release the nutrients. <coughs> Okay, so our fourth step is to manage pests, and I think this is the toughest one in an organic garden, is how do you manage all the pests that seem to want to get at your plants? This is the Colorado potato beetle there, laying some eggs on the underside of that leaf. And um, I've got here three of them. You see the potato beetle, this is the squash bug, and our friend the stink bug with its little green barrel-shaped eggs on the underside of the leaves. And you know, one of the best things you can do, honestly, especially if you have kids, is get them some little gardening gloves and help them get out there in the garden and just squish the bugs. <laughs> you know, squish the eggs, brush them off into a, a mason jar of soapy water. Um, you can brush the adults into the soapy water. One technique I have with squash bugs is if you water your squash plant, you'll see all the squash bugs come out and start crawling up the stems. Just pick them off. I mean, if you can pick one off, you prevent all the eggs that it would lay. So it's, you know, it's a good way to really reduce the population. If you just find that's not going to work for you, uh, another thing is to use row cover. And I have a little example here of this. It's, you know, just a thin fabric. Uh, they're usually made out of some kind of a polyester. 
Um, I've really adapted, you know, adopted this a lot in my garden now. I use different weights of row cover depending on uh, the season and what I'm trying to do. There's a very lightweight type for insect protection, and there's heavier ones for fall, um, you know, extending your garden season. If you just lay the cloth over the beds like this and kind of seal the edges with some soil or bricks or something or rocks, uh, that's called floating row cover because this, the plants grow up and they kind of push the, you know, almost up like a shroud, they push the cloth up. Um, and that works fine. The other way to do it is to have some kind of hoop structure. Um, in my garden, I have some pieces of rebar in the ground and then a electrical conduit, like a hollow electrical conduit PVC piping that I've arced across to hold the row cover up above the plants. A um, couple things about this. If you're growing something where you don't care about pollination in order to get the vegetable you want to eat, you can leave the row cover on all year, all, all season. So for example, Colorado, to exclude things like Colorado potato beetle, potatoes can be covered with row cover all of the time because you don't care about those flowers getting pollinated to get your potatoes. The only thing you need to be concerned about is making sure you don't have the pest under the cover, which can happen, and making sure it doesn't get too hot. So you really want to use the lightest weight um, insect fabric. Um, one of the tricks I like is for, well two really, is for cucumbers, those striped cucumber beetles that carry bacterial wealth, and the squash um, borers that drive us all nuts. Um, you know, if you can cover your plants early with the row cover, and leave them covered all the way until they're in full flower, and then you can take it off. Some people go so far as they go out, in, if they're home, they go out in the morning, take the row cover off, let the bees work, come back out, put, put the row cover back on, you know. The other thing I've seen done, and I might try this year, is to hand pollinate your squash with a paintbrush so that you just keep the cover on. You pull it back, hand pollinate, cover it back. You're just not letting the, those bugs get access at all. So I'm a big proponent of row cover. Um, I want to point you just uh, to another sheet that you have that are some classes from the Master Gardeners. This one that shows a little row cover there at the top. And the reason I'm pointing that out is if you look at the class on August 13th, I'm going to co-teach that class, and it's on vegetable garden season extension. And we're going to get more into row cover. We're going to set one up, a little tunnel, up at the demo garden at the Ag Center. So if you have an interest in extending your season, um, gardening into the late fall, getting a holiday broccoli, uh, you know, come and join us for that as well. So that was my shameless plug. All right, so um, the next thing to consider here is that when you think about the insect world, you know, not all bugs are bad. There's probably only about 10% of them that are bad. 90% of them are good, so we want to recognize and keep the good bugs. So one of the children that was here earlier, I was showing him, I have an assassin bug up here if you care to look at it. Um, and he said, oh, is that like a ladybug? And I was like, woohoo, that's really good. You know, he gets the idea. So the ladybird beetles, oops, sorry, they will eat a lot of aphids. The interesting thing is that this is the larva of the ladybird beetle, which we don't often realize that's what that is because it looks a little scary. And it actually even eats more aphids than the adults, so you want to keep those around. Um, this is a lay swing. They do a great job on leaf hoppers. And the assassin bug is kind of a general bug eater. Sometimes eats good bugs, but more often eats bad bugs, especially Japanese beetles. So they're good to keep too. One way to attract all these wonderful beneficial bugs to your garden is to plant flowers. If you plant um, some of the flowers that have a, a little tiny flower, like say basil that has those small little flowers, you'll get a lot of um, beneficials that will come into those. Um, marigolds are good, um, you know, a lot of the ones that I have listed here. You can even do things like nasturtiums, which you can then eat. They're kind of fun to decorate your salad with. Okay, so let's say just nothing's working. You're, you're done with row cover, you're, you, know, you, you haven't been able to squish them, kill them, you're just saying, okay, I've really had it. There are some organic insecticides that you can certainly choose. You just have to be aware. I mean, none of these are 100% safe. There's always some issues. Sometimes they impact non-target you know, insects. Um, so you just want to read the label and use them safely. Uh, pyrethrin is one that's kind of broad spectrum. You definitely don't want to spray that when you've got bees active. Uh, this worm and caterpillar killer, that's BT, that's a biological control made from a, a microbe. Uh, it's great for controlling those uh, cabbage worms in your broccoli and cabbage, the little green worms that get in there. 
Um, so that's one to think about. And there's insecticidal soaps that are good on the soft-bodied insects. Uh, kale and clay is one that I just purchased recently, this stuff called Surround, and I'm going to try it this year. It's a white powder, and you, you mix it up with water, and you spray it on the plants, and apparently the insects just don't like the feel of it on their feet and, and everything, and so it just, you know, it's like a barrier. It's great for orchards, apparently, and I have some apple trees. I'm just starting to get some apples, so I'm going to try it. Another thing to consider with problems is weeds. Um, I see a lot of gardens when I go around, and my husband and I used to have a, a garden in a community plot, and it's just disheartening to see the weeds just come and, you know, get way too past the point where they're in full flower and making seed, and, you know, you have to think each one of these weed seed, weed plants can make thousands of seeds. So, you know, the number one thing to me is to control them with mulch, and second is to just put elbow grease in it. Get out there and hoe them up, you know, pull them, you know, do what you can to just prevent them. Um, there's a couple other little strategies. One is to space plants apart that they're not so far apart that you have a lot of empty soil. It's nice when the plants are mature if their leaves would just touch so you have, you know, an area that's kind of shaded. I put this one in here to show you something. I thought this was kind of neat. This is from the Home and Garden Information Center. They actually planted a clover crop in here intentionally. And um, clover is a nice cover crop because it will fix nitrogen from the air and add nitrogen to the soil. And you can actually grow, put it around, you know, your, your plants. And if it gets to the point where it's making seeds that you don't want, just chop it up into the soil and you're adding organic matter. So it's kind of a win-win. Then we want to talk about managing diseases. And as I said, you know, resistant varieties are key. If you see a disease plant, it's good to pull it up and put it in the garbage. Don't put it in your compost. Um, if you see some diseased leaves, maybe you can just cut those off. Uh, another strategy with tomatoes is I know a lot of us grow these indeterminate tomatoes and they just get so huge. And um, one thing to try to do is to control them somewhat by nipping those buds out as they're coming and reduce the amount of foliage on the plant. It allows more air in. And when you think about what fungi like, like blight, they love moist and you know damp and dark. So if we let sun and air in, we have much less disease on our tomatoes. Um, the other thing to do is to rotate crops. Make sure you don't keep planting the same crop in the same place year after year. This little graphic down here is kind of a good one because it shows the idea of growing something that um, you mostly get roots from, like carrots, follow it with a nice crop of something that fixes nitrogen, like beans or peas, and then something that you harvest the tops of, like lettuce. So it's a good you know, idea of how to rotate. All right, so we're on our last step here. So um, I've got this picture. I think this is from a master gardener down in, near the, in Howard County. And uh, they were allowing us to use this picture. And I thought it was an interesting garden to show a couple concepts. One, you can see it's very intensively planted. I mean, there's not a lot of open area there for any weeds to grow. They are using straw mulch, it looks like here. And they have these nice established walkways, so they're not walking on the areas in their garden. They've also integrated flowers and uh, things to attract the beneficials in there. So some things with a garden um, would be to, to get out and observe. I'd urge you to be a plant detective. You know, it's fun. Get out, look at what's going on. Are you seeing some disease? Are you starting to see an insect problem? And try to nip it in the bud, you know? When those little bits of grass start coming up in the garden, pull them. You know, just try to manage it early before the problems get out of your control. Um, you might need to add a little fertilizer as you go along. You can succession plant, like for example, you might have lettuce in the spring and then beans in the summer and broccoli in the fall. And if you have good soil, you can do that. You can just keep, you know, planting in the same area. And I'd urge you to keep a log so that you can tell, you know, later what you've done, what's been successful, what you planted where. Um, just a little bit about watering. Again, watering is one of the things that can be a problem for us with fungal diseases on our plants. We just really don't usually want to water the leaves of the plant. It's much better to water the soil, and it's better to water deeply so that the roots will go down further and not stay up near the surface. Um, one exception would be if you have a real aphid infestation, you can put a blast of water on your plant to wash those aphids off, and then they have a little bit of a hard time getting back to the plant. But typically, these would be the things you want to follow. I find the soaker hoses work real well. I do have some drip irrigation in my yard for my trees that I've newly planted, but mostly in my garden, I use the soaker hoses. You know, they have little holes all along the hose, and if you just set it up with a timer or set your kitchen timer, let it run for an hour or two, 
you want to see that the water has gotten down, you know, a good 8, 10 inches into the soil at the end of the time, and then shut it off, and you're probably good for a week. All right, so as the season is ending, um, some things to consider. We want to remove the plant debris in the garden. A lot of times that debris will have disease, insect pests, so it's good to get that out of there. Um, better not to leave it bare, though, because you'll get a lot of winter um, weed seeds coming in. So it's good to cover it. I like straw. I use a lot of locally provided straw. I figure it's a nice recycling thing. Um, you can also plant some crops for the winter, like garlic and shallots. And here's a great time to put in some cover crops. So I brought a couple packages of seed here today. You can come up and see these if you like. Um, this is one that's buckwheat. It's a USDA organic buckwheat seed from Botanical Interests. And this one is called Soil Builder. It's peas and oats mix. So I was kind of excited to see these coming out with companies making little seed packs of cover crops. Because these are something you think more of as farmers doing. Um, last year I actually put the big forage, um, sorry, tillage radishes into my garden in one of my beds. And those things were huge. But they did die over the winter, and I just barely had to scratch the soil to plant my plants this spring and added a lot of organic matter to my soil. These two that I showed you are nice, the buckwheat and the peas and oats, because they winter kill so that you don't have a lot in the spring that you have to deal with to till under or chop into the soil. Others like the clovers or the vetch, those can, can tend to live over the winter, and they still work great. It's just whether you just want to have that work in the spring. So something to think about with cover crops. Okay, so those are our five steps. We're going to build the soil. I think out of all of these, that is absolutely the most important thing. Uh, pick the right plant, put it in the right place at the right time. Fertilize wisely, manage those problems organically when you can, and observe and care for your garden. Now, I have to say, after saying all this, that you know it's okay to not be a 100% organic gardener. I mean, it's a value system that you decide. If you want to, you know, say, I'm absolutely not going to do, you know, I'm not going to use any synthetic fertilizer or pesticide in my garden. Um, but if you, you know, you may find you do a blend, an 80-20 blend. The thing I think is, the thing I'd like to encourage you not to do is to use synthetic pesticides in your garden. I think that's where you get the most issue uh, as far as, you know, carryover into your crops. So as you go on your journey here of organic gardening and you need any information, if you look on the back of your green sheet, there is uh, the same information. The Home and Garden Information Center is down at the University of Maryland, and you can call them, and I think it's from, I think they're there from like 9 to 1 every day. And, you know, they will answer your questions. They'll go even to the Department of Agriculture if they have to to help you. You can send them a picture, you know, of what's going on. Um, there's the Grow and Eat at Maryland Gardening Network. This is kind of a neat site, and it also does Facebook uh, posting. I, I use Facebook, and so I just got a Facebook uh, that put something up yesterday saying it's going to frost Monday night and, you know, danger frost, so cover your plants. So it's kind of nice because they're reminding you as a vegetable gardener in Maryland what you need to be, you know, thinking about. And they also publish a blog, and many of the master gardeners post to that blog. Um, and it's fun to see what different people are doing. So that's a neat one to go, and you can sign up for the blog. And then last year, uh, we have just a wonderful resource here in Washington County. We have the Agricultural Center over on uh, Sharpshire Pike, and Annette Ibsen is the uh, coordinator over there, and she's great. She will, you know, if you need her to, she'll come to your home and try to help you. She will, you can bring her a piece of a plant or send her a picture. So she said, encourage everyone to call me or, you know, email me. Um, she also is the Master Gardener Coordinator, and she gave me some flyers today, which I have with me, about the Master Gardener Program. So if any of you think that you'd like to be a Master Gardener volunteer, uh, come and see me, and I'll, I'll give you a brochure, or you can contact Annette. So I just wish you great success as you move forward uh, with your organic garden. And we have, hopefully, we have a little time for some